735 in Trinidad and Tobago. Let's let's shift to something very different from what we've been discussing all the time, oil and diversification and, and, and business through the American Chamber of Commerce. Let's, let's talk about procreation because for some couples, treatment with donor sperm is their only hope of achieving a pregnancy and ultimately a family. But according to the Trinidad and Tobago IVF Fertility Center, there is currently a shortage of donor sperm available for use in fertility treatment. As a result, the center will be embarking on its first ever sperm donation drive. Head embryologist Christine Hickman and IVF nurse Melissa Pereira uh, join us to tell us some more about the drive. Good morning, ladies. Good, Good to have morning, you morning. On, on, to on the program. Uh, first and foremost, I asked you the question just before we went on here, and it was a surprise to me to know that the fertility center in Trinidad and Tobago has been around for some 15 years. Um, give us some context. Given that you're now engaging in uh, a first local sperm drive, what has been happening over the last 15 years? Um, Ms. Pereira, do you want to well, take it Over up? the last 15 years, it has been started up by one of our professors, Professor Ramswak, and he joined um, teams with or the doctor, Catherine Mintobain, and over the 15 years, they have been providing fertility treatment to couples that have been suffering with infertility through use mainly through donor eggs and um, artificial inseminations and so on. But as you said, we are now starting up the drive of sperm donation because we don't really have a bank here in Trinidad. So if anyone needed to have donor sperm, we would have to look at banks abroad internationally and ship it in. So we're now trying to establish a bank here in Trinidad. So, so the treatment has been available the, yeah. so for with donor sperm. So what we've been doing up to now is we've been uh, ship, importing the samples from abroad. Uh, the cost of that uh, magnifies by about tenfold to the cost of what the samples would cost abroad. Mm -hmm. So that, that's one of the problems we want to bypass because if, if the treatment's expensive, then people who need the treatment, a lot of them won't be able to afford it. So by making a local sperm bank, we then are able to bypass these costs of bringing the samples from abroad. Is there the legislation in place in Trinidad and Tobago to properly regulate uh, a, a, a procedure, a business like this? Because one of the, the things that would come to mind almost immediately is that if there is not proper regulation and monitoring and a legal framework that it can be open to abuse? Well, the main staff members of the fertility clinic, um, myself included, we have all been trained abroad. Okay, so I've been trained in the UK and we follow the regulations from, from the UK. We use them as guidelines. We're also members of, let's say, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, the European Society of Human Reproduction, and we follow their guidelines um, as to what is right and what is wrong and what we offer and what we don't. We also have a very high level of uh, standards that we meet. So we meet the st we uh, are going through an accreditation process, and we uh, f we have to follow these rules uh, in order to you know in our professional uh, field. But is so there is there an issue with with the, with, the, with local jurisdiction, local legal jurisdiction? The, re the reason I ask is that uh, is is it is it monitored locally by the Ministry of Health by any any local agency that that ensures that uh, all of these uh, the standards that you refer to? And I'm not by any means questioning your professional yeah. integrity, no, but, but the, the the question I'm asking is that shouldn't there be some local agency, whether as I said, Ministry of Health or some other arm of whether it's a government-based agency, to ensure that standards are met and that that there are legal protection for citizens who would choose to, to utilize this service? Uh, I understand your question. That, that what we need to take into consideration is that it's a small population in Trinidad. So we are the only fertility clinic who, who offers the wide range of treatments within Trinidad. Okay, so it's not, um, when you have the legal frameworks uh, in place, the, um, uh, another body to regulate, they tend to, to be in countries which have a lot of fertility clinics. So what we do is we set our standards according to what um, the professional bodies that we are members of have set, and we follow those standards. So. Um, Ms. Pereira, uh, it's, it's interesting in, in a country like ours, and especially as we we're coming into the Easter period and, and uh, the whole question of, of Catholicism and then Christianity comes in, 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 into view, and uh, the, the, the issue of artificial insemination and in vitro fertilization and, and all of these issues. Are there moral issues here raised uh, that that would have that you would have been challenged personally, uh, and, and others in in the organisation would have been challenged personally about the whole question of uh, of fertility treatment and all of the horror stories that some some may come up with. And, but beyond anything else, the moral question that this is something that 
if God has determined that you are not to have a child, you will not have a child. And the, the, the activities that you all are engaged in are against God's law. How, how do you view what people perceive to be a moral dilemma in that sense? Okay, well, a lot of people do have do come out with that moral um, issue. But the thing is, at the end of the day, we have to remember that IVF treatment isn't 100% guaranteed. And if you want to think about it in terms of leaving it in God's hands, yes, it is still to the point, to, to that degree, leaving it in God's hand. Because when we transfer an embryo, or embryos back to the uterus, there's nothing we, the doctors, can do to ensure that implantation takes place. So to some degree, it is still left in God's hands, whether he wants that, to have that child or not. Uh, Ms. Sigmund, you, you understand that point? Because uh, it, it happens not just in, in Trinidad and Tobago, but it happens in other parts of the world where people raise these issues, often with violent opposition, demonstrations, and all sorts of things. That, and we could just highlight the whole question of the, the abortion right. clinics and so on. Yeah, I um, think uh, with regards to fertility clinic, yeah. uh, it has gone through a transformation in the last uh, three decades. Uh, I mean, the first IVF baby is now 34 years old, okay? So uh, at first it wasn't accepted, but this has changed through time. And even religions have changed their, uh, how they have perceived uh, fertility treatments. Uh, so even within the Islam religion, for instance, there are some sects that accept um, fertility treatment, uh, again, with the Jewish religion and in, in, in most Christian religions. Um, so it's, it's an aspect, some religions are still against it. However, the way we see it is, it's up to the personal choice and we, we need to be to make the treatment available and it's up to the person to decide whether that's for them or not and so let's talk about the the, the fertility drive the, okay. the, the, what what how is this going to, to, to move forward do you basically have uh, anybody just simply walking off the street and saying that they're, they're willing to donate how how is this pro process no, going there, to, to move forward a, there's a process and uh, it's set up because we need to protect three main aspects and all the people involved so the first one is the the person donating okay so they need to have informed consent and that's a very important aspect of it they need to understand the implications of donating so we we put them through counseling there's an interview process to make sure they know what they're getting involved okay so they understand the full implications the second one is the person who's going to be receiving the sample okay so that's the recipient of the sample we need to protect them so what we do is we need to screen that donor for infectious diseases hepatitis b hep b hep c uh, gonorrhea syphilis i mean we go through a whole range they do um, a lot of tests to get through and the third person that we need to protect is the child to be born. So we, we check whether the donor has any hereditary diseases. Uh, we check for sickle cell, for instance. Um, so we, all of these are to protect everybody involved, okay? And because of this strict screening process, only about one in 100 or one in 20 people who, who apply to become a donor actually qualify. So it's not a guarantee, it's not that uh, any, any person can come in and out and we will uh, urge people to come in and, and try and help the couples who need fertility treatment with donor sperm. However, uh, not everybody's gonna be accepted into the program. And how is, how is this drive going to work? Is it, is it going to be public information where, where people will be advised as to, to how the process is, is, is going to work? How is it gonna be done? Well, we initially, we, there is an, we have a contact number, 333-9489. Um, anyone who is interested in donating, thinking that they would like to become onto our donor program, they can call that, uh, that number, get some information from us. We would initially go through a, a short screening pro process on the phone there, asking them certain questions, like what Christina just mentioned, asking about hereditary diseases, anything that may be affecting you medically. Once you've passed that initial on the phone screening, the next will guide you through the next step, which will be filling in an application form, com actually coming into the clinic, doing a semen analysis, further screening for the infectious screenings and so on, and then you move through the, the program. And as Christina said, at the end of that, only about one in 500, one in 100 will be acceptable on the program. Are, are, are donors compensated for, 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 for their donation? They are, they are compensated. 
Um, <laughs> However, we thought, yeah. we, we're trying to get people to come in who have altruistic reasons, okay? Because yeah, you, you realize yes. where, I'm, where I'm heading, that people yes. can say, well, yeah. well, uh, is a real stud. I, I, I could make some serious <laughs> money from this, uh, and, um, and I, could, I could, could make a living. The, it's not something that you, you could make a living of. The way that we're, we're trying to get people to come in is they want to come in because they want to help. Okay, so let, let me just give you an, an angle of uh, one patient that we've sure. had that we recently got pregnant. That patient had been trying to get pregnant for 13 years. Okay, 13 years, every month, the period comes and the couple get disappointed that, okay, maybe next month. And then after 13 years, they came to see us. We then did surgery on the man, because he, we had saw that he had no sperm, to see if we could recover sperm from the testicles. We then came back with the bad news to them saying, sorry, there's no sperm, not even in the testicles. So um, he then went to, um, they went away. We to explained to them donor sperm is the only option. And their first reaction was no, no, no. And they left because nobody plans yes. to be treated with donor sperm. Yeah. Uh, they came back about six months later. Uh, they looked through the donor sperm. They chose together as a couple, they chose the sample that they wanted and they had treatment and they got pregnant. And then we called them to say the test, it came back positive. And you know, they, they were in disbelief. Okay, so we've managed to, to bypass the problem with, with this treatment. So it's something that has, they're now going to go on to be a happy family. They're going to, that, that child is then going to have children. Their family line is going to continue. And that was the gift that that donor has given that family. And it's important to put it in that context. We're going to yeah. take a quick break at 7.46, but we're going to continue our discussion with our two guests, Christina Hickman, head embryologist at the Trinidad and Tobago IVF Fertility Center. And also with us is IVF nurse Melissa Pereira to give us some more information and some more context uh, to, to, to the this uh, situation that uh, we, we are focusing on in the final interview segment of Morning Edition. We'll be back right after this. Seven fifty-one in Trinidad and Tobago. Continuing our discussion with uh, Christina Hickman, head embryologist at the Trinidad and Tobago IVF Fertility Centre, and uh, IVF nurse Melissa Pereira, talking about uh, the local uh, sperm drive. And uh, you can get information at three 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 nine four eight nine. The website is www.trinidadivf.com. Um, what are the criteria uh, for for those who would be accepted? Uh, to, to, to be part of this donation drive? Okay, so the criteria we're looking at for donors, they have to be between the ages of 18 and 39. Um, we're looking for them to be generally healthy, um, no medical issues such as hypertension or diabetes and as such, and um, be a non-smoker of at least three months, a general healthy lifestyle, minimum drinking, healthy weight, um, and that's basically it. Um, they should have a background of their both, both parents medical history because that way we're looking for hereditary um, genetic disorders. And what so if I lie? What if I have, I've been a heavy smoker and I, I drink heavily but just, just because I, 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 for whatever reason, <laughs> altruistic or otherwise, yeah. I, I, want, I want to donate but I, and, and, I, and I lie on, on, on the form. How, how do you pick that up? True testing <laughs> is going to be reflected on your sperm quality, it's going to be reflected on other tests we do for you health-wise. So, so, so you can't get you can't get away. <laughs> no, no. Uh, and uh, the issues the uh, that that we discussed of, of, of uh, uh, Ms. Sikman, the whole question of whether or not people have second thoughts or whether or not people feel that they're doing the right thing. Maybe they they, they would have uh, been part of the process and then chatting with somebody and saying you know, you know you're all uh, you're all doing something wrong and, and and or even just on their own they would have second thoughts. Uh, how, do, how do the ethics of this entire situation play out? B okay. Because you're dealing with human beings whose opinions and, and feelings might change over time. Uh, how does that work out? Well, what we have is we have an ethics committee present in the clinic. So we'll have a, at least a scientist, a doctor, and a layman person at least will be present. And uh, issues which have bring up an ethical uh, dilemma uh, are discussed in this group. So they're not decided by a single person. When it comes to a donor, if a donor suddenly decides that no, he doesn't want to donate, then he can step back. Uh, we almost try to talk them out of it through the process, okay? Because we want them to understand every single positive and negative aspect of donating sperm. So they go through something called counseling, where they see a fertility counselor who pretty much tells them the truth about donating. And um, um, so we make sure that 
this is really right for them. We're not, we don't, you know, everybody who's getting involved in this, all parties give what, what I was saying, informed consent. Are, okay. are, are donors or, or th all those participating in the process, if things go wrong, uh, is there recourse to, to, to legal action? Because uh, not that we're as litigious a society as some, some other so-called first world countries, but uh, uh, will, is the IVF Fertility Center indemnified or protected from legal action uh, if, if things for whatever reason would, would go wrong? Yes, we, we, we follow. I mean, it, it's highly unlikely that things would go wrong because we have all the framework in place to protect the, uh, the patients, the donors, and everybody who's becoming involved. So um, it's highly unlikely that that would be required. But the, yes, you always have the legal framework and we have a responsibility to the patients, which we, we do our best to meet. So it's, um, yes, there is a legal framework behind as well. One of the other issues that we also discussed during the course of the break, Ms. Pereira, is the whole question of almost supermarket shopping for your children. That, okay, you, 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 a couple can't have a child, but they want this, this strong, strapping male to be born of them, that sort of thing, and they, they, they don't want it to be some, some dweeby, nerdy sort of thing. Uh, is, that, is that something that comes into the whole ethical discussion, that you, you shouldn't be able to pick and choose what sort of child you want? Exactly, yes, and as we said, the ethics, we have, do have an ethics committee, so, and not everyone is eligible of coming on to the recipient part of the program, because as we said, we have to cover, we have to protect all aspects of the whole donation, the donor, the recipient, and the child to be born. So there's an ethics, that, that ethical part of it, so we screen, so see if that is, the, that is your main reason, wanting to come on to have a designer baby, you're not going to be accepted onto the donor recipient part of, of it. Because at the end of the day, we want this child to be loved, we want this child to be wanted, and if this child turns out not to your expectations in terms of being tall, strapped, blonde hair, blue eyes, whatever reason, you're not gonna be accepted onto right, well, Again, you, you have the information on the screen. Yeah. I'll give it to you once again, 333-9489, Thanks very much for coming in to, to offer some, some context uh, to it all uh, as relating to this local sperm drive. We have the news for you coming up, then I'll be back to wrap up the program. <laughs>